Good morning, I'm Steve Wiggins. I'm a research fellow and an agricultural economist at the Overseas Development Institute in London. We're a think tank, we work on development issues, and I work on agricultural and rural development. Good morning, Steve. You are one of the authors uh, of two interesting new reports that were prepared for the G8 on linking smallholders to markets. What is the single most important finding or recommendation of each of these reports? I'm going to just talk about the, the bigger of the two reports, which is the leaping and learning, the um, linking smallholders to markets in Africa, which is the one for which I, read, I, I led the research team. And basically what we've been doing there, Pascal, is we've been looking at a lot of case studies of ways in which smallholders in Africa get access to markets for their produce, but also markets for, for finance, markets for seeds, markets for fertilizer. We took case studies on the basis that there was already a lot of activity on the ground. And that initial supposition proved was, was proved uh, time and time again. We found an enormous amount of activity, some of it um, initiated by business organizations like agricultural processors, agricultural exporters, but much of it by NGOs and NGOs dedicated to dealing with market issues. NGOs such as Technoserve, SNV, uh, ACDI, Volca, uh, AgriPro Focus, and, and so on. So there's an enormous wealth of experience out there, but not all of it is, is, is fully documented. And our job really was to try and document it. And I guess uh, our messages are that there is a great deal of common understanding of what makes it possible to link smallholders to, to, to markets. And in our main report, the Leaping and Learning report, we structure this around three main areas. And one of those areas very simply says, don't think about linking farmers to markets unless there's a good business case, unless the economics make sense, unless you're working for the right markets, unless the business conditions are there, the investment conditions are in place, and the publicly funded infrastructure, health, um, research extension is there in place. And um, that's obvious, but uh, in practice, it's not always a respected condition. The second big area that we talk about is that what has to happen has to be facilitative. Uh, successful interventions uh, skillfully provide sufficient support for smallholders to get going and then back off. Now, doing that is quite an art form, but the principle is very clear. We're trying to facilitate learning processes by everybody involved in the chain, rather than trying to set things up perfectly right from the start. And the third area is talking about the actual organization of farmers. Farmers almost always have to be grouped in order to relate to larger uh, actors in the supply chain, like fertilizer dealers, like processors, exporters, and so on. And we need models of linkages. Now, contract farming is the best known of those forms of linkages which are out there, but there are plenty of other ways that one can successfully link uh, smallholders to markets. And the very biggest uh, message we've got of the, the lot is that what needs to be scaled up is not a particular form, a particular model, it's the process, yeah? It's the process mm -hmm. that matters, learning, is absolutely critical in the successful experiences. Well, thanks for sketching the whole scope out for us. Um, now, I was thinking that the concept of linking smallholder farmers to market uh, is, is coming up lately again, but it's not really a new a new concept. And uh, there, you, you also put out a whole lot of conditions, which obviously raises some question marks if you, if you would be someone who, who would consider this. So what is the potential with regards to enhancing food and, uh, food and nutrition security in rural areas? And is the concept maybe not a little bit overrated? Are smallholders really competitive enough looking at all the conditionalities that you had put up? 
What are the major challenges, in other words, for African sure, small rural sure. farmers to link into markets? Pascal, this is, this is an excellent question, and the short answer goes something like this. The first thing we have to recognize is you're absolutely right that within Africa, there are probably no more than one in three of current smallholders who can ever have decent livelihoods in full-time, small-scale commercial farming. We need to understand that. We need to accept that. One in three, probably the maximum, can get a full-time livelihood out of small-scale small commercial farming. We need to recognize that. So you're absolutely right. We don't want to drive this one to death and say, this is a solution to poverty for all people currently on the land. It isn't. But it's a driver of the rural economy that will create jobs, create wealth in society, which will create jobs for those who don't have enough land, who don't have the, the interest in farming, and so on. Now, the second part of the answer to this is, we are interested in those cases in which we are linking very small farmers, people with less than one hectare, to the markets that matter for them. And the markets that often really matter for them are the markets that allow them to get access to, to fertilizer and seed. Now, a really good example of this is the One Acre Fund in Western Kenya. Works largely with female farmers, and all it does is it provides in advance, before the harvest, obviously before the harvest, seed and fertilizer of maize and beans to very small farmers in Western Kenya. Then once they produce their harvest, and using the right kind of seed and fertilizer, in the relatively good agronomic conditions they've got, they can double their yield. Part of that additional yield is given back to one acre as repayment for the input. And right now, one acre is covering about 80% of its costs. And most of the other 20% the other is the overhead of, of setting up the particular scheme. So there are ways of getting access to inputs for people who are very small scale farmers and people who belong to this two in three who will probably never have decent livelihoods out of agriculture alone. They're not going to stop farming but farming will be one part of a portfolio of their livelihoods. And there are things that we can do with that kind of farmer. The two reports provide also key learnings on overcoming the challenges of market access and on including smallholder farmers sustainable business solutions across the whole value chain. Now, putting this all into reports, is one thing, and what do you think, how can the pickup of the key lessons with farmers be improved? There are key lessons in here for people who make policy, uh, for people who have influence, for the powerful, and so on. And the lessons are all, they're not about rocket science, yeah? Um, most of what I have in the report here is about getting what I would call the fundamentals correct which is understanding what the nature of a business case is. And a business case is, is really down to two or three things. And the first of those is there has to be an investment climate that allows people to invest and innovate. Now, when I say that, people tend to say, oh my goodness, it's another of these arguments in favor of perfection, and I don't work in a per perfect country. No, that's not the lessons that we have. The lessons we have is making sure that the investment climate doesn't have any clunking great elephant trap shaped holes in it. It's overcoming the worst obstacles that are sometimes have been seen. In modern Africa, fortunately, most countries have learned that lesson and the investment climates are so much better than they were 20 or 30 years ago. But there are still some stumbling blocks that you can find in individual countries. A second big lesson is you simply have to invest in the public goods in rural areas that make it possible for small farmers to respond to markets. And that's things like roads and power supplies, it's decent health, education, clean water, farmers who aren't educated, farmers who are unhealthy can't get on with farming, and it's a certain investment in research and extension so we've got a flow of public knowledge to back up the farmers. So those are all the fundamentals. Beyond the fundamentals, we have an agenda that says, look for innovative practice, encourage innovative practice, 
And I think you can ask me a question in a moment where I can tell you how you encourage innovative <laughs> practice. Um, and learn from it. Make sure that things are reasonably well documented, distilled, and communicated in form so that the lessons can be far more widely shared than they are at the moment. Across Africa, different actors are trying to improve the links between small-scale farmers and companies within the entire value chain. Donors are also involved, and they they obviously do it in a different way than business would do, and they do it with various degrees of success, as we all know. Yes. So what is the main lesson, especially for donors seeking to replicate initial successes and avoid pitfalls, especially the message here to the members of the Global Donor Platform? I've got three things on my scratch pad, yeah? Number one is most of what we've got in our report, it's stuff that you probably already know. Uh, none of this is rocket science. None of this is, 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 is extraordinary in any way. Most of the things that make a difference are fairly straightforward actions. So don't be seduced by people who come along and tell you there is a new way of doing it that will solve old problems uh, overnight for no money at all. Uh, that simply isn't the case. Second point, don't get too, too obsessed about niche markets for exciting new products with air freighted produce to Europe. The biggest markets for African farmers, the most stable markets, the markets which are the simplest to reach, the most accessible, the least demanding, they are the domestic and regional markets. And boy, they are booming, booming, booming. So, you know, let's, let's keep our, our eyes focused on the ground. There are some farmers who can go for the very high value niche markets. Brilliant. Let them get on with it. Private actors will probably get them there. Donors have tended, some donors have tended to be obsessed with some of these high value niche markets, uh, air freighted to Europe, to, to the USA, and so on. Uh, look, look, look to the more commoner garden things. Third big message that's in there for the donors is this is not an area linking smallholders to markets where success can always happen all the time at every step along the along the line. Like most innovative things, like most business starts, there'll be plenty of failures along the line. So how do you deal with that? Most donors can't actually handle this. You can't invest directly in supporting such links. You probably have to go through intermediaries. You probably have to set up challenge funds. You have to look to portfolios where the failures are offset by the successes that will inevitably follow if enough investments are made. And you have to back this up with the learning that says, yes, we will fail from time to time, but we're going to learn from those failures. But we can't have anything in the area of innovation like this where we can deliver to a donor who says, I have to meet a short-term uh, target and I cannot possibly experience failure. If that's the case for your donor agency, work through intermediaries. And there are some great intermediaries out there. You know, the ACDI Vocas, the SMBs, the Technoserve, the One Acre Funds. Uh, these people are doing some really, really good work. Um, and, you know, please, please support them. Have a look at what they're doing. Uh, support them. And uh, make sure they get everything documented, evaluated, and so that we get a good learning out of it. Just go into that one more time a little bit as donors are oft criticized for their short cycles and it all has to do with their internal ways of having to do things. You know, they, they have to set reliable plans and the world doesn't go according to plans. They have to set targets and maybe other targets are reached, as you say. Is there any suggestion from you and, and your team in terms of over, overcoming maybe that obstacle a little bit? Obviously, we all have to have short-term targets, um, which, are, which are part of a, the path towards longer-term achievements. Uh, what, I would, what I would ask people to do is to set the short-term targets, not as outcome uh, targets so much as process targets, and to say, you know, with, within a two-year period, we will set up a challenge fund. The challenge fund will have made contact with uh, 
X number of, of, of pharma groups, it will have conducted the following things, which will be process, process, process. And then the, the outcomes that says, you know, we will have improved the livelihoods of 10,000 smallholder farmers. We'll set those five or six years down the road and we'll do the check on the outcomes at that particular moment. But our short term targets, we'll set those in terms of processes and we'll also set up our log frames so that we validate um, double loop learning, that we, we, we validate uh, monitoring experiences which admit failure and say, well, we have to reprogram in this particular case and create space in our targetry that allows us to embrace processes of that kind, which are not linear processes, and, and to respect that that is part of the way that we will get to the desirable end points, which will show up. They will show up. Experience says they will show up. They won't be there in two or three years, but they will be there after five, six, seven years. And at that point, we can, we can check out the outcomes in terms of incomes, livelihoods, and so on. Thank you very much, Steve. A pleasure.